Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, an introduction to the Career Instructional Model, sponsored by the CTE Technical Assistance Center of New York. A few technical points before we begin. Only today's presenter will be audible. The webinar will be approximately 45 minutes with 15 minutes for questions toward the end. You may submit a question during the webinar to be addressed at the end by typing it into the questions pane on the control panel. All questions are logged and unanswered questions may be addressed by today's presenter via email. If you become disconnected, please call 518-723-2137. For your information and reference, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the CTE Technical Assistance Center website at nyctecenter.org within 72 hours. If you have questions or suggestions regarding upcoming webinars, please contact the Technical Assistance Center at CTE TAC at spnet.us. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Dick Jones, and delighted that many of you have joined us this afternoon for uh, a webinar. And uh, thank you for Gretchen for setting this up. Uh, I'd like to uh, amend one of Gretchen's comments about uh, submitting questions. Um, I'd like to try and take those through the uh, session this afternoon. So at any time you've got some questions, please submit those and uh, I'll have her get those to me and we'll try and uh, answer some of those questions. We want to make this uh, more interactive in a session rather than just a straight uh, presentation. We've got some polling questions for you to respond to um, and uh, we're looking forward to having this more of uh, an interaction. Delighted to share with you this afternoon some of the work that I've been doing over the last year uh, to define what we're calling a career instructional model. It's part of the career readiness initiatives uh, under the, the uh, CTE Technical Assistance Center. Um, this has been some exciting work because it combines a lot of the experiences that I've had over the years. I've been very fortunate to have a variety of experiences in my education career, which is now entering its fifth decade. That doesn't seem possible. Um, but I started out in career and technical education as a high school agriculture teacher, and uh, I've had a variety of experiences working in a number of academic areas and consulting with hundreds of school districts across the country. And I continue to learn as to what are the elements that really create a great learning environment for students. And I'll share with you some of, uh, of those reflections uh, in this new model, which is meant to have teachers think about their instruction. One of the things that I ask you to do in preparation for this video is to view um, a video cast. And we've placed this on uh, YouTube. And I hope that some of you have had the opportunity to look at that. And that gives you a background for the uh, career model. I'm going to go into a little bit more discussion about that and particularly the additional webinars that we're going to conduct in this series are going to be much more interactive. So I'd like you to consider uh, viewing the videos that will be uh, recommended each time so that you can have some background and we can move uh, directly into more discussion uh, as part of the webinars. But this first one is uh, an introduction and in doing that I'm going to build upon the short presentation that you saw in that video to talk about how you can use this uh, model and begin to uh, use this in thinking about your own instruction or as an instructional leader uh, in a school. I have a one-page uh, handout and if you haven't uh, seen a reference to that, here's the link where you can download that one handout. So you might want to jot down this tiny URL uh, uh, web address so that you could have access to uh, that particular page. This becomes a nice uh, single page uh, reference uh, to the career model uh, that explains it and the actions that are a part of that particular model. When I'm doing live presentations, this is uh, one page that I often make sure uh, people have and, be and can become a convenient reference. So some of you might want, if you've got access there, jump over, download that handout um, to use for future reference, or you might even use it today um, as we go along. The other thing that I have done is to create a um, Twitter account for the career model. 
If you want to keep up with the um, uh, activities related to the career model, I continue to get ideas from educators that I interact with. And um, those of you that are Twitter users, uh, suggest you go to career underscore model, um, and you can sign up. And as I continue to work and share ideas around the career model, that will keep you up to date uh, with those. Just an uh, overview of the agenda. I want to do a little bit to review the career model and give you some additional explanations beyond what was uh, on the website or the uh, video cast uh, that I recommended. I want to answer any questions that you've got about the model. So as you've got some ideas and questions from what you've already seen, um, or as I go along today, uh, please submit those questions. Um, I want to explain and demonstrate the surveys. This is the most exciting piece, not just the fact that we have the model, but that we can uh, use some surveys for teachers to think about their own instructional practices. And this is a free service of the Technical Assistance Center, and want to explain these surveys and encourage you and your colleagues to use those. I'm going to make some connections about how this model can be connected to improving uh, instruction. And uh, also review the upcoming additional webinars uh, in this survey or in the series where we'll be going into uh, greater depth uh, around each of these. I want to start right now with a poll question um, and thinking about this notion of career ready. And I'd like you to answer, some question, answer a question uh, with some responses. What factor do you think is most important in helping students to become career ready? So Gretchen, if you would put that survey up. Gretchen, are you there? I was having some trouble getting that display there. Um, seeing the responses now. Um, the greatest response is good instruction. Um, and uh, the lowest is common core state standards. I find that kind of interesting in the uh, fact that so much of our discussion is about core standards. Um, and then uh, kind of evenly divided between curriculum, ongoing professional development, and good quality assessments. Um, and I'm not surprised at that. Um, and um, actually delighted to see this focus about instruction because it's, it re it's consistent with what uh, I believe uh, uh, as well. And uh, this uh, model and surveys are really an attempt to uh, influence and promote uh, good quality instruction.
Uh, current technical education is uh, excited uh, because it's hands-on, it's active and social. Uh, teachers focus on the whole student. Uh, there's also a manipulative piece, um, and students can measure their progress and observe the things that they're learning or the things that they're able to produce. Um, it also is relevant to their future plans um, and uh, what they see as their, their future. Um, it's a reason the students put forth effort in career and technical education. And I said, is there a way that, in addition to promoting more career and technical education, that we can connect that to um, uh, elements of good instruction and begin to think about some categories within those? And that led me to identify these six elements, connect with relevance, assess for proficiency, reward creativity and innovation, engage as learn independent learners, empower with hope and confidence, and rate work habits and collaborative behaviors. Those six elements not only reflect the strong qualities of CTE, but as I outlined in the video, reflect a lot of the popular literature and research about what's really important in the elements of good quality instruction. And those six elements just happen to start with the letter C-A-R-E-E-R, -E -E thus I call it the career instructional model. I get in a lot of schools and a lot of classrooms, and I see some great instruction, but I also see some instruction that's not very engaging to students. And what I might label as traditional college readiness, it serves well for some students, but not for all, where lessons are built around large chunks of content with no context, and students don't see any relevance in that. Teachers objectively grade students on the average number of questions that they get correct. They restrict lessons to recall of facts learn through rote memorization. They insist on following a pacing guide to cover the curriculum um, and all students learning at the same speed and doing the same work. They narrow students thinking as passive accumulators of knowledge and they give students only independent work and reduce grades for poor behavior. I hope that none of you teach like that but I see a lot of that instruction and mu much of it falls within the kind of standards driven college readiness. Well, instead of building lessons around large chunks of college with no, contents, uh, no content, we need to connect that curriculum with relevance. Instead of um, grading on the average number of questions correct, correct, we need to assess for proficiency. And it's not about memorization of facts, it's about developing creative and analytical thinking. Not every student's going to learn the same way. And the challenge for teachers to be effective is to engage students as independent learners. We need to also empower students with hope and confidence. Many students don't buy into the notion, oh, stick in school and get a diploma and a great degree, and then you can go out into the workforce. Students can make a difference right now, and we need to recognize that learning is a way to empower them to make that difference. And along the way, we need to develop good work habits and encourage collaboration. That's how problem solving occurs in the future. So I see this career model as a real contrast to a lot of the boring instruction that students often refer to in school. Thus, you see the acronym BORING defines those characteristics. I want to talk a little bit about uh, each of the elements in the model. Here you can see the six um, uh, elements, and I've arranged, the, arranged these in kind of a honeycomb fashion with the six elements. Um, these really define high quality instruction, and it defines the elements related to career readiness to prepare students for their future. For those of you that are familiar with the quadrant D of the rigor relevance framework and how we need to move lessons to high rigor, high relevance, these same instructional elements define good quality instruction that leads to quadrant D learning. It reflects what we know about brain research and how students learn differently and uh, learn when they see the relevance um, in their learning. And the beauty of this is it can be applied to all disciplines, all grade levels. And more importantly, it can be data-driven using the surveys that I'm going to talk about today. The, um, um, let me go into some of the actions in each of these six elements um, very briefly. You can see these lists. Uh, each of these has five actions, and they become the organizers for the surveys that I'm going to show you a little bit later on. 
but they define each of the key elements in defining uh, each of these. Connect with relevance. Relevance has two dimensions. Relevance to the future and the real world, but also relevance to the student. So one element for a teacher is to activate students' interest and make that connection between the curriculum and their individual experiences. The other dimension of connection to the real world is to use authentic materials, and students can judge when something is just busy work or constructed for education purposes and doesn't give them um, real world problems. Another part of the connection is to uh, connect to previous knowledge. It's important for teachers to know their students, know their prior knowledge, and have an appropriate stretch. Often students get discouraged when they see a huge leap between what they currently know and new information that's presented to them. An aspect of this authentic materials are real-world problems, problems that are more open-ended and not leading to a nice, neat solution that's easy to grade. It may be a bit messy in trying to figure it out and define what the real problem is. These are the kinds of work that demonstrate authenticity, relevance, and really challenge students. And finally, application. That real learning comes through application, not just recall. And uh, that's the defined in the rigor relevant framework. And the more that you can get students to apply their knowledge. And this is a consistent piece of the Common Core Standards that many people fail to recognize. If we're truly going to implement Common Core Standards, and you read the language in those standards, it talks not about the recall of knowledge, um, but the application uh, of knowledge. The Rigor Relevance Framework, and I hope that many of you are familiar with that, is a really powerful tool for reflection on instruction. And these surveys just go that added dimension. And many CTE teachers that teach very comfortably in Quadrant B, high degree of application, whenever they're teaching something, they may introduce the basics in Quadrant A, but move very quickly to Quadrant B in the application, and then ultimately try and get to more challenging problems in Quadrant D. Um, it is that relevance piece that truly engages the students and moves to that high level of learning. I've seen some advanced courses in school that say they get students to quadrant D, but they take them through quadrant C first. Students have to demonstrate a high level of analytical thinking and success before they um, become successful. The um, rigor relevant framework fits very nicely with this model, particularly in this aspect of connect with relevance. So here's the five actions under Connect with Relevance, and you'll see those again for those of you that go on and take the survey. The second element is assess for proficiency, and this gets into the aspects of assessment and um, grading, which are some of the areas that I'm often critical of schools that we don't focus enough on. We need to make sure that our assessments match what is essential to learn. And part of that is making sure that if we're moving to high levels of learning, we also have challenging assessments. The second is to make sure that students understand the assessment criteria. This should move students into the mode of beginning to um, evaluate and reflect on their own work. We need to scale assessments for proficiency. Oftentimes, we arbitrarily average together grades, and that average grade may not truly demonstrate a true level of proficiency. In areas of music, we gauge that grading based upon being able to um, have your best um, uh, quality work um, demonstrate your level of success. But in too many academic courses, we just average things together from all of the experiences. Whatever scale you use needs to be showing where a student is in relationship to being proficient, and they can measure their continual progress. We need to make sure that assessments extend the learning and not just um, um, let a student be satisfied with achieving a certain level um, um, in their uh, achievement. Some students are satisfied just to pass a course or to get a C. 
but the assessment system should drive students to want to continue to learn uh, more and deepen their knowledge. And on the grading piece, we need to keep students and parents informed. The purpose of grading is for communication. And the simpler it is, the better. But sometimes those simple grading systems don't convey the full measure uh, of learning. So it's important to um, um, make sure that part of that is the simplicity in keeping students informed. A couple of um, cartoons that illustrate this notion of grading, and I've had a lot of extended discussions with um, uh, many teachers on grading uh, policies. Many students come to school and they are conditioned to play the grade game, whether it's to pass the course or become the valedictorian. And they don't equate grading with learning. And I think the biggest challenge for us as educators, and that's what this element is about, is to make sure that the way that we assess students and the way that we grade students is about demonstrating a level of proficiency uh, in learning. And it's not just about being able to answer all the questions right on the quiz show. I love this quote by Bob Marzano that grades are so imprecise they're almost meaningless. We give great credibility to numbers and as pointed out in this cartoon, if we can make those numbers very precise, they convey an aspect of confidence that we have accurately measured a student's level of proficiency. Transferring uh, proficiency into a numerical item is convenient for conveying information to parents but it by no means measures some validity as to whether that's a true measure of proficiency. It takes multiple measures, it takes multiple measures over time, and we need to make sure that our assessment practices do that and conveys that message to staff and students. Not just getting to a number and simply conveying the number and said, oh, here is your level of, of proficiency. So here are the five actions uh, related to assess for proficiency. and uh, uh, really require um, us to do a lot of good work in improving our assessment and grading practices. The next ar area is rewarding creativity and, and innovation. Uh, the actions here are that we need to encourage originality in student work and the way we design the work and what we're looking for in answers. This doesn't mean it doesn't relate to standards and learning. Um, if we think this through, we can link the creative student work to the learning standards. Within creativity, we also want to help students discover their um, talents. And um, oftentimes, students have abilities that we don't utilize or get them to um, become familiar with. And by having a variety of work, we often can have some creativity in that regard. We want to encourage risk-taking and support that risk-taking with some positive feedback and support in order to encourage a higher level of creativity. One of the best authors in this realm of supporting creativity and innovation is Ken Robinson. I'd highly recommend you take a look at um, one of his TED lectures or one of his books, uh, The Element or Out of Our Minds. Uh, Ken does a great job in pointing out the limitations of our current education system in providing um, high quality uh, education. Here are the five elements in the actions, uh, or elements, uh, actions in the element that relate to uh, rewarding creativity and innovation. The fourth element is about engagement. And I've had the opportunity to think a great deal about engagement. And uh, a lot of the things that I've learned about engagement and the writing that I've done has been about uh, trying to um, put forth, getting students to put forth effort in their improvement. Often teachers will talk about lack of success and lack of student motivation. It isn't the students lack motivation, their mo lack of motivation to what we want them to learn about. And so part of that relates to the relevance piece and connecting with students. But here are some of the other characteristics that lead to good um, engagement. Uh, the relationship piece, which is the foundation for student engagement. Students will not put forth any effort until they know that you really truly care about them. Having good routines and procedures, and for a lack of engaged classroom, this is often the place to begin and practice some of those routines that maybe students have forgotten about. Teachers also have a responsibility for active learning strategies. 
not using the same strategies all the time, and particularly avoiding those where the student is a passive learner. And we need to personalize learning. Not every student is engaged in the same kinds of experiences. And we need to make sure that students are engaged in a variety of things and that teachers can make some adjustments to differentiate and to personalize learning so that, that student feels engaged. And within this category, I've also put the uh, transferable information uh, in study skills, which are so important in making sure that that student becomes that lifelong learner. We're trying to build those skills, not just to answer questions at the end of the chapter, but for them to answer questions as they move along into the real world. There's a um, TED Talk that I found particularly useful um, in, um, uh, around this topic of engagement. And it's from the um, um, UCLA uh, Community School, which is a new school in the Los Angeles uh, area. And um, Karen Hunter talks about their e-portfolios and uh, a great TED Talk to listen to. But what's even better is listening to the testimony from Janet Nunez, who makes a reference to the fact that our learning was lost and then found. As she got into a new school and it, uh, she discovered the teachers cared about her and were trying to find a way to support her in her learning and the use of her portfolio that allowed her to reflect on her learning. We throw around the term independent, innovative, critical thinkers, but then we ask students to sit passively and obey every directive from the teachers. Um, I've heard some outstanding students that talked about negative school experiences that remained with them into their adult career because on one hand the teacher encouraged them to develop some independent thinking, take a point of view and support that point of view but then got a poor grade because it wasn't the teacher's point of view. And I think one of the struggles for us as teachers, if we're really to develop independent thinkers, we need to operate and conduct and facilitate a classroom where students have some uh, opportunity for originality and independence. The next area, number five, is to empower with hope and confidence. And this one combines a number of things that I've read over the last five or six years of important elements of really engaging students so that they leave school with some optimism and a passion for what they want to do. This includes the social emotional piece. And one of the reasons even students that can do well academically do not succeed because they haven't developed good social emotional skills to function effectively um, in an environment to control and manage their own um, behaviors in a social situation are critical to being successful as well as the knowledge and thinking school skills that we develop. Acquiring a growth mindset in the book for, by Carol Dweck um, uh, is a great reminder of that. It's not about accumulating knowledge that gu guarantees your success and you're going to fail along the way. And the real success comes from being able to learn from those failure experiences so that they become a growth and learning uh, experience. We want to support students to improve their reflection and their thinking, the metacognition, if you want to use a big word, um, in getting students not just to get an answer but to understand why they got an answer, how they got the wrong answer, so they're beginning to analyze and reflect on their own thinking. We want to develop the student's passion to make a difference. And when students exert some interest in an area, we want to nurture those interests. Uh, some students gravitate and find them what's themselves in career and technical education because they have an interest in that particular career field, uh, whether it's in animals or serving at others or health or, or mechanics. Um, but students can really do some remarkable things. And we want to encourage them to develop those talents in finding ways that they can make a difference using those talents right now before they complete their education. And part of that is helping to change students' sense of community and caring um, and introducing students to some experiences beyond the school in their individual community. One of the uh, TED Talks and uh, that I found particularly useful um, is Angela Duckworth. And here's the link to Angela's, and you can search for her. Angela talks about the phrase grit. 
and uh, she is a former teacher who entered the teaching field a little bit late after another career, but then because of her experiences in middle school, um, rec became a psychologist and has continued to study this notion of grit and what guarantees success is not our measure of innate intelligence, but developing this ability to persevere and persist in learning. And there's some of our education experiences in the classroom that nurture that, and sometimes we stifle that. And this is an area we need to continue to learn from. So grit fits within this notion of the actions related to empowering with hope and confidence. The final area is about rating work habits and collaborative skills. Um, this begins by identifying the collaborative uh, skills and work habits that you desire, and maybe even develop those with students uh, so that they can be a part uh, of that. You want students to begin to identify their strengths and weaknesses and continue to reflect on those uh, over a period of time. Providing opportunities uh, for students to, to demonstrate their work habits. So you can't build positive work habits unless students get a chance to demonstrate those in the classroom. Also providing some opportunities for collaboration. Not everything can be done as a team project, but we need to make sure we're providing more of those with some structured guidance and support to help to develop uh, skills around collaboration. We need to provide students with feedback on their habits, and that becomes the aspect of growth uh, in that regard. So work habits and collaborative behaviors is the six that completes uh, and rounds out the uh, areas of this particular career model. So you can see in each of these that uh, touches on a lot of good aspects of instruction that we've learned over a period of time, and tr I've tried to weave those together in a simple structure that we can remember. But let me talk about the surveys. These are not an evaluation. They're really meant as a personal tool for teachers for them to reflect around their own instruction. There are six separate surveys. And when you go to the website, you'll be given a choice to uh, decide which one of those you want to work on. Um, I wouldn't recommend that you look at all of them at the same time. Maybe spread out those, those out over a period of time. Maybe work with a, with a team or a peer around uh, one particular area in which you could have some discussions uh, in regard to those. I'm going to take you to the website right now and just show you how this survey works. Um, to show you how simple it is and uh, what you can obtain uh, from it. The uh, New York CTE Technical Assistance Center um, is the URL nyctecenter.org. Um, and I hope that for those of you that are in New York State, if you're not already registered at the site, I hope that you will do that. Um, within the tax center, this is a service for all New York educators. You don't have to be a CTE teacher. But even for those of you, I know some people are online that aren't in New York State, I'm going to give you uh, a website link in a moment where you can get access to the surveys uh, as well through the Successful Practices Network. I'm going to go into the section of the website after you register that's called Best Practices. And that is a habit of getting in there. There's a section called Instructional Resources. I've opened that up, and there is a link to the Career Instructional Model. So this gives you the overview of the model. So you can use those menus at the left-hand side to find uh, this particular page. These are the videos that describe um, the uh, uh, model and how it's developed. There is a resource list. Um, that uh, is related to a number of books and videos that you might use around each of these elements. And um, the links to each of the surveys. I'm going to take the survey right now very quickly online to show you how quickly it can work. We only ask for your name. You can put in a fictitious name or your initials if you want to. It's what gets printed out on the report. We ask for your grade level and subject area because we want to use some of that for the data. Um, the survey consists of um, 25 uh, statements 
and you're asked to re uh, rate these statements with always, frequently, sometimes, and never. Some of these statements are positive and some are negative, so you want to um, read them carefully. Um, I'm going to go through in the interest of time, just uh, responding randomly. So I'm going to come out with an artificial score um, because I'm not taking the time to read these. Now you see a full list of all of the responses, and um, there was one I missed, so let me go back and rate that one. And you can change your responses if you want to. That's all there is to it, is taking those 25 items and rating them um, on that leveled scale. You can print this page out if you want this for a reference so you know how that you related, rated those. And particularly if you come back at a later time, that will be important. So I click Submit now, and it's given me a, a report. Um, it says in this element of Assess for Proficiency. It's got my name on here. It's got the date. Um, and my score is 5.8 out of 10. So as I would expect by randomly filling those in, I got a, uh, an average response. Now it tells me that in each of these, um, and these were introduced um, uh, randomly, but grouped now by the five uh, action categories. Relate assessments to learning outcomes, that was one that I did very well. So it says congratulations, and it reinforces some of those. In some of these others, I did not do so well. Um, keep students and parents informed reminding me, remember the purpose of grading is to communicate progress and learning. Look for opportunities to make grades available on a continual basis. So giving me some positive suggestions. That's all there is to it. I can download this into a report um, that I can use and a chance to think about my own instruction. You can decide if you want to share it with anyone, if you want to work as a team and have a discussion about it, but it's really meant to reflect on instruction. And that's all there is to it in terms of the survey. Again, the website for those of you in New York State is uh, nyctecenter.org. Um, and there's a variety of rich resources on there. And the career surveys are some new things that we've added. I mentioned the career instructional model uh, resources um, is an extensive list organized by each of the categories of things that I've been familiar with or come across recently um, and some of my colleagues have shared with me uh, some great things that can be a part of your own development or to share with others in a group professional development. Now for those of you that aren't in New York State um, and uh, um, don't want to register as a New York educator in the Technical Assistance Center website. One of the initiatives that the Successful Practices Network is engaging on, which is a national initiative, is to develop a Career Readiness Institute. And so right now we're making these surveys available on the uh, Career Readiness Institute portion of our website. There's going to be some changes in that over the next couple months as this initiative grows. But right now if you go to the website CRISPNetwork.org. Uh, um, you can um, work to, uh, in the left-hand margin, a menu that says Career Instructional Model, and it will take you to the same set of surveys um, to respond to. So for those of you outside of New York State, you can access those uh, in that manner. Okay, next uh, poll question. Um, I want to get some interaction here. Um, one of the questions that somebody asked me about this is, well, how does this relate to teacher evaluation? And I've got some answers to that, but I thought I'd first ask you a, a question about what do you predict will be the impact of using the teacher evaluation frameworks? And many of you are involved, and those of you in New York know we've had a, uh, in our second year of teacher evaluation. What do you think will be the impact from all of this focus on the teacher evaluation impacts in teacher evaluation frameworks?
Now, I don't know why I can't see the uh, polling. Gretchen, you want to give me the results on that? I can't see this one. Sure. The majority of people responded. It was pretty much a tie between greatly improved teaching and learning and modestly improved teaching and learning. Okay. Um, that's positive. Um, I've, I've heard some um, positive statements that, you know, for many times, in, in many instances, the evaluation has opened up conversations about uh, instruction. Uh, one of the things that I see is an awful lot of uh, also focusing on meeting those criteria and not really thinking about what that means uh, in the classroom. Um, I've looked at a lot of the teaching frameworks, and uh, Charlotte Danielson is one that's used extensively in New York and uh, familiar with the four domains, uh, planning, preparation, classroom environment, instruction, and professional responsibilities. The uh, framework includes a number of elements uh, in e each of those. Uh, it gets very extensive in identifying uh, the specific elements of that framework. Another one that's very popular, uh, particularly national, is Bob Marzano's teacher evaluation model. has four domains conveniently, but organized differently, classroom strategies and behaviors, planning and preparation, reflecting on teaching and collegiality and professionalism. Uh, again, a lot of uh, elements that are a part of that. Um, I have some reservations that I think a, a lot of this focus, while it will get teachers to think about good teaching practices, they don't really uh, inspire great teaching. You can't argue with any of the elements. They are very accurate and detailed in the analysis of all the things that go into the teaching profession. Charlotte Danielson's was really designed for teacher preparation. What do you need to learn to become a teacher? But uh, they're hard to keep those things in mind and inspiring. I think in many cases we've created some paralysis in the profession because they're so analytical and so complex the teachers can't remember them. I think it also underemphasizes instruction, and um, particularly instruction that is a dynamic adjusting for the needs of individual students. I think there's too much of an emphasis on teacher classroom instruction. So while teachers deserve feedback uh, and evaluation is useful, and I think we've made some changes in doing that, I'd like to see us inspire great teaching by using this particular model. I think this speaks to the elements of what will really make a difference in students' future and create a much more engaging environment that uh, can reach every student, not just some students. I want to talk now just for a moment about the process of improving teaching, and I've got another poll question for you, um, if you'd put that up. And again, Gretchen, I'm not seeing that one, so you're going to have to give me the responses again orally. All right, we have about 64% of attendees saying reflect on your own practices and, six, and another large group that they watch another teacher. Those are the two largest responses. Yeah, and I, and I could have predicted that. I think those two are, are some of the, the, the biggest ones in, in regard to that. Um, in the last year or so, I've really become um, um, focused on this aspect. I've been reflecting a lot about reflection. How bad is that? Um, and how powerful that is as a professional learning experience. And particularly those of you that are in a leadership role, how do we stimulate that kind of reflection? And it was then that interest that led me to create these surveys and said, what can we do more? Rather than just telling teachers how to teach and some modeling is good, but really getting teachers to reflect on practices. And so these surveys are an attempt to provide one more tool out there that we can hope to stimulate more reflection because I think that's what really makes the difference. Surveys can be really powerful in reflection. 
think about how often they occur in popular magazines. You read a little survey and you reflect about your dating life or your nutritional practices uh, from that particular survey. Some of the other things that, that stimulate reflection, good thoughtful questions, and, and leaders do this well uh, to stimulate um, positive improvement in practice. The peer observations, um, teachers think about their own practice when they observe another teacher teaching. Not to replicate that teacher, but to say, could I have taught that that way? Would I have handled that student response differently? Likewise, site visits, which become a larger observation there than just observing a classroom would observe a whole school. Peer review of learning and student work, powerful practice in which teachers begin to reflect on their own learning. Um, video analysis, looking at video and trying to analyze how that relates to their own teaching. Um, book study uh, and personal writing. Um, all of those um, in this list, and I particularly like the last one, the more that we can get teachers to individually write. It doesn't have to be publishing a book, but just to do a, a blog or a micro blog, putting things out in a, in a um, Twitter um, feed becomes a good way of thinking about what's really important, what's worth sharing. You're thinking about practice when you do that. So I'm delighted to see the interest in reflection um, and these surveys and the model that helped to build that is really about this notion of stimulating reflection around teaching with a simple model that emphasizes what's really important. I hope that you will uh, use the surveys um, and look for opportunities to continue the discussion. Uh, we're going to produce six more webinars, um, uh, one webinar devoted to each of the elements. Here's the schedule uh, up on the screen. We're going to do these uh, over a six-week time period beginning after the first of the year in 2014. Um, different days of the week, so um, um, make sure you note these dates. We'll also be sending out uh, notices on our mailing list of those connected with the Technical Assistance Center. In each of these, I'm going to try and do a, a flipped format again. I'm going to have a video for you to watch in advance, which gives you some background. And then I will also, uh, in the webinar, I'm going to be interviewing some teacher practitioners uh, to share. I'm going to interview them and have them share some of the specific practices that they're doing related to adding relevance or changing assessment practices or uh, engaging students within the classroom. And I've identified some great people to share some ideas with you uh, to continue to deepen your understanding uh, about those elements. But the final poll question, let me ask you this about what else would you like to, to have to learn more about the career model? What might I do in some of the discretionary time that, that, that I've got? And then this one is not a fixed choice. You can indicate more than one, um, and that will be a piece that I can look to. Uh, we've done the surveys. We're putting together a resource list in the webinars. But I think this offers great potential for us having some continued dialogue and learning uh, around what really makes uh, instruction so engaging to students. So give us some feedback on that. And Gretchen, if you'd put that poll question up. The majority of responses um, were video examples of teaching practices, following closely with face-to-face -face workshops, and then a list of books and articles to read. Okay, good, good. Well, we're, I think the video piece, many people like those and uh, certainly have a, uh, a few of those, and uh, I think that uh, becomes some good suggestions for us in, in uh, how we continue that. So uh, let me just uh, wrap up here with some of the ways that I think you can begin to use the surveys. I've talked a lot about personal reflection um, and what you seek to improve. If you've got an interest in one of these, um, take the survey, see what it says, and see if it uh, identifies things that you want to try and uh, work on. And a lot of the resources that we have available can help to give you specific suggestions in doing that. The surveys would be a great pre-activity for a professional development workshop that might be done by peers or an outside presenter. Having the teachers, if it's on creativity or if it's on grading practices, take the survey in advance, um, and then you've already got some background for teachers to engage uh, in some discussion around that particular topic. It can be an agenda for a conversation within your professional learning community. Um, so as you're 
looking at instructional practices, this breaks the ice. Um, and for teachers to begin to reflect and share ideas about what's working and what's not working. And thinking about the teacher evaluation piece again, it can be part of your professional portfolio um, as you um, um, continue to show your growth in the profession, that you might use periodic assessments in these over time um, in order to um, show that um, evaluation. So that's the survey and the introduction. I hope you've given you a little uh, deeper understanding uh, of that this afternoon. Um, uh, Gretchen, have we gotten any questions come in that uh, would like me to respond to in the remaining time that we've got? At this time, we don't have any questions. We can give people a few minutes if they have any they'd like to type in. Okay. Now, I uh, gave you the links before of my uh, address, and uh, this webinar will be online um, so that you can uh, um, follow this up, share, um, but uh, also the whole website uh, is a resource for us to continue to share ideas and discussion around the career instructional model. At this time, it doesn't seem we have any questions. So on behalf of the, of the CTE Technical Assistance Center of New York, I'd like to thank you for joining today's webinar presented by Duke Jones. And as a reminder, this webinar will be available for viewing at nyctecenter.org within 72 hours.